I'm not used to public speaking, I'm used to ranting. And when I, when I talked to Bruce Hayes this morning, it's like, how do you do it? He said, don't rant, don't, don't do that. Dot points. Just to have a page, A4 page of dot points. That's yeah. what I've got, that A4 page of dot points, you can do them in any order. Um, so I've had lots of advice, quite conflicting advice, but he did make a good suggestion with regards to water. Okay, the first, I talked to Gil Scrine, who made the fantastic, on his team, or a fantastic activist and a good bloke. And he said, start with a joke. And I already had a joke in mind. That is, I'm a POM, and I, I do complain and I whinge too much. Even other POMs complain that I do that. Um, so if I do that, uh, or if I go completely off the air, just do this with your hand. Can everyone do that, just to show you can do it? You know, that, that's it, that's it. So I know. I know. Thank you. Step back a bit, Stephen. What? Step back a bit. That's what? Please step back a bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Now, the list. Um, there's a list of um, of the 12 people who died, were killed by the policy on Manus and Nauru. There are many other people who have had their lives destroyed by it, but these are the ones that actually died on Manus and Nauru. Okay, first is 17th of February 2014, Reza Barati of Iran, we all know, actually murdered in the full sense of the term. Second, 22nd of June 2014, Ibrahim Hussein of Pakistan. Third, on the 5th of September uh, 2014, Hamid Karzai, also Iran. Then 29th of April 2006, Omid Masumali of Iran, who's Omid, his name means hope. 11th of May 2016, Rakib Khan of Bangladesh. 2nd of August 2016, Kamal Hussain, Pakistan. 24th of December 2016, Faisal Ishak Ahmed, Sudan. 7th of August 2017, Hamid Shamshiripur, Iranian. 2nd October 2017, Rajiv Rajendran, Sri Lankan, I imagine Tamil. 2nd of November 2017, Jahangir, of Bangladesh. 22nd of May 2018, uh, Savim uh, Korning. Uh, of Myanmar, actually a Rohingya stateless person. 15th of June 2018, Faribos Karami, Iranian again. And I, I read that because I, I went to a, uh, it was a Civil Liberties Association of New South Wales um, event, and I asked them just to read the 12 names to make it real, the, who the people were, some of the people whose rights we have completely failed to protect. And I was actually insulted by Meredith Bergman. <laughs> and then, and then I, later she, I went back and said, um, it's actually Vivian's idea, but I went back and said, go to see, to see, talk to Steve Blanks. And I gave it to him. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then towards the end of the evening, I said, are you going to do it? He says, no time. So I thought, well, if I do something like this, I'll, I'll make sure I do it because it's, these are real people, we are, they're not just a phenomenon or a, a concept, it's, it's these people and it was terrible each time one died, you heard from their mothers and their fathers quite often and that this, they were murdered by the policy um, of, of keeping people, of treating refugees like criminals now what's my dot point, so that's this that's the list, ok the next thing is my father's letter which is very interesting if I can find it among my papers here. Okay, and I need my glasses. This is what my father wrote. He, as a refugee, he went to um, from Austria to New Zealand, and it took a long time. It took, I guess, between one and two years. I don't know all the things that happened in that time. He was in Denmark for a while. But when he got to New Zealand, well, you'll re I'll, I'll read you the letter. Um, what happened was the RSL uh, the RSA, they call it in New Zealand, they said to, um, OK, the war's ended now, it's 1945, the war's finished, all the European refugees, they can nick off home. And this was his response. The RSA and aliens. Sir, when I read the report that a, a recent annual conference of the New Zealand Returned Servicemen's Association, like the RSL here, um, a resolution was carried urging the deportation of refugees to their own countries with the same amount of money as they had when they entered the Dominion, New Zealand. 
I wondered whether I was reading an obsolete German fascist paper or whether it all happened in God, God's own country, in New Zealand. I came to this country as a refugee from, from Austria five years ago and have been in the New Zealand Air Force for nearly two years, wearing the King's uniform and thinking that I'm doing all I can to, uh, to help to fight the malignant tendency of the 20th century human being, the tendency towards fascism. I am bitterly disappointed to find that those people who have actively fought fascism, obviously many of them without knowing what fascism actually is, take up an attitude right here in New Zealand that is so very much akin to the very ideas they have been fighting against overseas. To me, the only difference between the morality of expulsion of refugees from New Zealand and the confiscation of their property and the establishment of concentration camps with all their horrors in Germany is merely one of a geographical nature. So that's Dad showing off his English a bit at the end. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, like when I read this, I think it must have been after he died. I just, like, knocked the six. Like, I would have loved to have written this letter. Well, I wouldn't have liked to have been in that situation, but that was a strong letter. He was white hot with anger over what's happening, what was happening in what the RSL, RSA had done. And, um, you know, I think we should be too. I mean, it is fascism. He nails it. He nails it in 1945. And this was before the Refugee Convention. Um, so I'll put that to one side. I'll look at my dot points again. Recommended by Bruce Hay. Um, yeah, look, I'm, it's not going to be like a, a, an Agatha Christie novel. i answer the question first of all. How do we get rid of it? How do we get back to the Refugee Convention? I'll tell you. I always think it's very swish when people have it all on their phone. I think I'll do that next time. Next time. Well, what it is, there's got to be a, I'll do it from memory, like it's, it's got to be a, 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 an education campaign on, uh, on the convention. We've got to see it for what it is. This is an attack on all our rights. It has always been that. that. But see it not in terms of today, but see it, see it in terms of, you know, bulldozing of skeletal bodies into mass graves. That's where it came from. And I'll like, go into it a little bit what the, um, this bloke who actually wrote it was called Paul Weiss. He was also from Austria. He was born 14 years before my father in 1907 in Vienna. He was a lawyer. He escaped from Dachau. That's who wrote the Refugee Convention, 37 articles of it. And um, he's called the saviour of refugee protection. That's what he's known as. He died in 1991. Now, we ha have to personalise it, we have to understand. And I take my hat off, really, to, um, to Barry Fatterfod, who, who really enlivened me to what this was all about and related it to, had I related it to my own father and his history. And she was talking about the voyage of the damned and the, this boat, the SS St. Louis, that left uh, in, in uh, 1939, left Hamburg, full of Jewish people, and then was refused entry everywhere. I mean, this was a tamper of its day. It was refused everywhere, and it went back, and most, a lot of the people, some of them escaped, but a lot of them ended up, ended up in concentration camps. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing we really have to do, I think, is to change the language, and I've always said this. It's not detention. It's not detention. Detention is short-term. Let's look at what Beirut Bichani wrote in, in his book, um, uh, no Friend But The Mountains. He called it, as you know, writings from Manus prison. And he could tell us a thing or two about that. It's prison, for goodness sakes. And there's no such thing as mandatory detention as just dressing something up, as locking people up. Let's not use the term anymore. Uh, uh, and there are other terms that are just misnomers. Of course, we know illegals has all been bullshit from the start. But how, long, how, how come it take, took so long that that was, that was thrown into the bin? It took too long. Uh, but the, the ones I hate is, uh, uh, at the time, we've been suffering it for so many years, is people smuggling. People, smug people smuggling, there must be concealment. There is no concealment in people being brought from Indonesia to here. I don't think it's happening very much, but we don't know. Um, uh, smuggling needs concealment. They're being brought from Indonesia to the border where they can claim asylum, which is their right. So that's, that's all wrong. And so there's all these slurs. And actually, sadly, the, um, it's been picked up by the advocacy organisations. And they should know, I think they should know better. 
We use our own language, as the people who are involved in the Timor campaign will know, Peter and so on. We use our own language. We don't use the government's language. We use the language of uh, resistance, not the language of power. So um, thank you to Brendan Murphy for that. Um, Brendan Doyle for that. This morning. Um, OK, I think I've lost my dot points somewhere. Um, language, we've done that. OK. These are the letters. OK. We had a thing. My, my wife told me, like, you don't do public speaking and you don't do it very well, so why not you write letters really well? So why don't you do letters? And I thought, that's a good idea. It's called a pistillary narrative. It's nothing to do with getting pissed. It's to do with you write letters to who you want to do it. And so I've got a few letters here. Just let, I just let rip last night. OK. Dear Head of Amnesty in Australia. Because Honestly, I haven't... I would have liked it, someone from an, an organisation to be here. This is my idea, to, to have someone from a, from a human rights organisation. But there was no one. So, and I... OK, maybe I'd not better cut out the whinging letters. Why, do, why don't you answer my letters? Why not? Um, why haven't you... It, it goes on like that. Sorry. And they, yes, sorry. That, that, um, they've never come to see us at our weekly protest every Friday. Now, I think it's a great thing, a real solidarity, that the people in the offices, they come down, they have a look sometime, and, they, and, they, and people in demonstrations. There seems to be this apartheid thing of people in offices and the NGOs and other people on the streets. I don't know why this should be so. Um, plus, they don't answer my letters. And I was actually in correspondence with um, Peter Benenson, who founded the organisation for quite a long time. He was a great bloke. He understood you have to get human rights into the culture. You have to talk about them. So, um, look forward to seeing you, S. I haven't put the names of the people here, but um, they do have names, the heads. Okay, what's this one? Dear Morrison, I know I should be uh, um, seeing patterns of power and not focusing on individuals, but I don't like you. Because <laughs> uh, your lump of <laughs> talks about this lump of coal and where to, what you should do with it. Um, you do <laughs> and you didn't know there was slavery. I think you really don't know there was slavery. And it ends with piss off, Stephen. And this, <laughs> this, sorry. I just let rip last night. And I thought this was the right thing to do. I read it to my wife. She said, you can't read that. Um, dear relative in Melbourne, this is my Austrian relative in Melbourne. So you are not a refugee because Austria was not at war. Really? But being a refugee is being a well found, have, having a well-founded fear of persecution. Dad was a refugee, so you must have been one. You want nothing to do with the Bill Wheeler family and want nothing to do with my projects. Sorry to use you in this way, Stephen. <laughs> Look, this is something I've often thought about. If all the people who were refugees, plus their children, would actually do something. We could, we could get rid of it in 10 minutes. There are so many refugees in Australia. Where are they hiding? I just think they should be, there should be solidarity with the new refugees. Yes, they may be Muslim. doesn't matter. They're refugees. Same situation. So that's my frustration. I often think that when I'm at Town Hall. Uh, dear, dear passerby, you say, I'm all right, as you pass our stall. I'm all right, Jack. Um, if you remember the film I'm Alright Jack with Peter Sollers in it they say, they say that, I'm alright but the refugees aren't and neither is Julian Assange neither is um, uh, Kuman Jai Walker who is dead, killed by police all with our taxpayer dollars we are not alright beyond you and your family many things uh, 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 beyond you and your family many things are our responsibility and are not all right. I feel like tripping them up or something. I don't know. I've never really got used to that. So many people just will just walk past. They think you're some other... Anyway. Um, I'll do, do this. have this all on my phone next time, I think. Stephen, speaking to the mic. Dear, dear Ida Batrose. Okay, Ida Batrose. Start answering your letters. I understand many of my letters were thrown away by security. Because... The envelopes contain letters to all the three ABC boards. Stop treating the audience with contempt. Stop following government orders. Democratise the ABC. That's what we should be doing. 
do your job. They used to, they, they used, I mean, this is a thing that people don't often say, that, that they used to write back, write letters back. Politicians, they used to write back. Now it's across the board, they don't. I think it's a scandal. Dear Rupert Murdoch, I don't know what to say to you. The latest Green Left is better than all your publications put together. We will win. To resist is to win. Those are the words of Shanana Guzman of the Team Rees, you, the people you vil vilified for so long. Have a happy retirement soon. P.S. Don't fall off your, your yacht into the sea. OK, we're nearly there. Craig Foster, I, I, I really like your press club speech very much, but we are not better than this. The present situation is an exact reflection of reality, the, the power structure, the cowardice, and the occasional solidarity and bravery. Um, you treat people as equals. Your friends are refugees. Well done. I look forward to see, meeting you. Thank you, Stephen. You can blame Vivian for all these. <laughs> okay. I blame you. <laughs> What's that? I blame you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Dear Clover Moore, thank you, for, um, thank you for telling me that Sydney was a refugee welcome zone since 2006. How come so few people uh, know this? We are fighting fascism. Did you know that the, 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 the Madrid Town Hall has refugee welcome, refugees welcome across the, the, its facade? And Palermo's mayor defies the Italian government policy and really helps refugees. Why not us? Um, I've written something else there, but um, what happens is that the, the, more often than not, the town hall people hassle us. This is their policy, and I explained to them, this is your policy. Okay. Dear Archie Roach, thank you for the last chapter of Tell, Tell Me Why. I will read the rest. Thank you for talking about the sadness, um, alienation and dislocation in Australia. So, so, so many non-Indigenous people relate to your song, Took the Children Away. Um, I think this or, uh, and my, my Island Home should be the national anthem. I look forward to the film with you and your late partner, Ruby Hunter. Okay, I've got... This is, this is a fabulous book here by, by Archie Roach, the last chapter. If it's, all, it's, if it's all half as good as the last chapter, it will be brilliant. Okay. Dear, dear Ruba Kashan, thank you for making the most inspiring activist film ever, White Riot. Your fan, Stephen. This is it. Thanks to Liv, I got, saw it during the British Film Festival. It is fantastic. It will get you going. I want young people to see it. It's got fantastic music. It's from 78. Step 78. Back, step back a bit. Okay. From 1970. When... Uh, it was, I mean, I'd like to see activism in Australia a whole lot more sort of creative, just like this film. Um, so it's, it's uh, National Front. I was in England then. The National Front was, uh, was on the rise, and they, and they uh, started the Rock Against Racism. Really worth it watching that film. So uh, that's it. So to solve this problem, yeah, to solve the problem... Uh, yeah, we're, 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 thanks. Good. Nearly, nearly done. Oh, well there's, well, there's one more to Noam Chomsky. There must be one. Yeah, he's the one who... Oh, dear Nick McKim. He doesn't like back either. Do you remember Sarah Hansen Young? Do what she did when she was fighting for refugees. Answering bloody letters. <laughs> I get rude there. And the same with Adam Bant, to be honest. Um... Rubik Hashan, and the last one must be, I do write one too, Noam Chomsky, who's, who does write back. When people say they can't write back, they can't respond, they can't engage, I think Noam Chomsky, he's 94 years old, always, always does it. It's at this level that we really need to get moving. It's so frustrating for activists. We should be doing what Melbourne does, really fight, um, and change our language, and, 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 and do a lot. Get, I did have it somewhere, the list of things that we needed to do to really overcome it. We can win. The trouble is that Australia has infected the rest of the world with this rubbish of locking up refugees. If we can, yeah, and if, if we can defeat it here, if we can do the decent thing here, that will show the rest of the world, look, you know, we've found it's a lot of rubbish, so you will, you, you, maybe you can change direction too, but it's shameful that we have actually given the idea to places like, you know, 
Denmark, for God's sakes, you know. So we really need to defeat it where it started, right here. Thank you. Everybody, thank you, Peter, Steve, for having me here, and it is my pleasure to speak before you here. Uh, I pay my respect to the elderly, past and present, to the first owner of this land, Aboriginal people. Uh, as you, as Peter mentioned, my name is Mohammad Salapur. I'm an Iranian Australian citizen. By the help I, of a family friend and local people, I fled Iran on March 1995 to Pakistan. And then, under the supervision of the UNSCR in Istanbul, uh, Islamabad, I came to Australia late in 1997. Uh, today, I try to break my speech in two parts that make it easier for all of us to understand. The first part, uh, first part I try to focus on Australia obligation on international uh, obligation to international refugee convention, and the second part I try to, because I'm from Iran, to bring you an example of what, why and at what stage a person decided to leave his homeland or her homeland and uh, seek asylum. Thank you. Dear friends, Presently, Australia maintains various international legal obligations in relation to refugees and asylum seekers. Such obligations arising from the Convention relating to the status of refugees 1941 and the 1969 Protocol relating to the status of refugees, collectively recognized as a Refugees Convention. At the same time, Australia holds a legal obligation to establishment of the key objective and purpose of the Refugee Convention in the good faith. In the, uh, which are guarantee of fundamental freedom and rights for refugees without penalty and discrimination. Over the, pa uh, the past decades, the Australian government Successfully, policy regarding refugees has received major criticism from the United Nations, as well as legal human rights school. The debate maintained that Australia policy resulting in establishing a violation of the country obligation under Article 30, 33 of the Refugee Convention concerning non reformment of a person to another state or to the frontier of territories where their life or freedom will be at danger. Australia, unfortunately, has acted against the international consumption of the good faith in the multitude of ways which directly violated article of the Refugees, Refugees Convention. This breach of international law became evident during the Howard time with the establishment of the new border control regime that aimed at deterring the arrival of refugees by boat known as Operation Relax, and as well as the Pacific Solution. I argue, and as is so obvious, that the succeeding government of Australia have violated international law through the reconstruction of the Migration Act 1958 as well as the implementation of Operation Solidarity Borders. I know in 2008 it's been revoked, but unfortunately they replaced it with more restriction uh, law regarding to the refugees. Now it is good if we look at why an Iranian or a Persian refugee seems uh, seek asylum from his homeland. So as I mentioned, it because of um, an Iranian, I pick Iran as my case study. And to do that, I pick up the latest report by a special repertoire of, uh, on the situation of human rights in Iran, which has been presented to the United Nations Human Rights Council on January 13 this year. Uh, Professor Javid Rahman, at paragraph 59 of his report, stated that the special repertoire, other human rights mechanisms, and civil society have over the years documented example of grave violation of human rights. These included the large-scale loot 
use of the later force by security, law enforcement, and other state agents against peaceful protesters in the nationwide uh, protests in, 19, in 2009, 2019, 2020, and 2021, leading to alarming high number of injuries and death, together with arrest, uh, enforced disappearance, detention, persecution, and execution. Other examples included large-scale enforced disappearance and summary execution of real or perceived political dissidents, including children in 1982 and 1988, which to date have not been the subject of any investigation or accountability but where destruction of evidence for those crimes is ongoing uh, in what appeared to be an official state policy of bibbing these events from memory. The assassination in the period of 1988 to 1998 of dissident intellectual artists known as the chain murders remain without accountability as do killing of the activity or outside of the country borders. More examples included the downing of the Ukrainian airline flight PS752 and the systematic use of lethal force against border Korea. He also, in paragraph number one, indicated that between 1st January and December 2021, at least 275 people executed, included at least two child offenders and 10 women, which is, I think, make it 50% more than the last year. The use of the large ammunition against the border couriers, leading to the killing and injuring of over 200 individuals between 1st January and 1st December 2021. Between January and October 2021, close to 500 Kurdish individuals, including teachers, borders, couriers, artists, human rights and environmental rights defenders, journalists, and lawyers were arrested or detained. At least 140 of these were charged with national security-related crimes. Professor Javid Rahman noted with the concern the continued repression and repression of the religious minority, including through the first forceful closing of house of worship on national security ground. Between 1st January and 1st December 2021, at least 53 Christians were arrested for the practice of their religious belief. He noted with the concern the continuation targeting of the members of Baha'i community and their properties and the intensive smear campaign on social media against some of his representatives. In October 2021, four members of the Baha'i community were sentenced to five years of imprisonment for seeking to access higher education. And as you know, the situation of women are not really better than that. I just pick up two examples of his report. Uh, yes, thank you. In November 2021, the Guardian Council, which is included 12 uh, religious men making every single decision regarding to the law and law enforcement in Iran, uh, ratified the law on young people and protection of the family, what they call it, in fact. And in Article 61, allows the imposition of the death penalty under the charge of the corruption on earth for anyone who preferred abortion on the large scale. The, the same law uh, also provides di direct and indirect incentive to increase earlier marriage without providing an age restrictions. According to the official figures, between March 2020 and March 2021, over 31,000 marriages of the girls between the ages of 10 to 14 were recorded. An increase of 10.5% compared to the previous year. So uh, this is what's happening out in society. And once you've been arrested and subjected to detention, that all will come up.
that I think part of law uh, 29. The use of forced confusion uh, under torture as evidence for death penalty conviction and the continued lack of investigation into torture allegations. The use of the unlawful force by security, law enforcement, and other state agencies continue at an alarming scale in the context of the peaceful assembly against border courier and in place of detention without subsequent investigation or accountability. Denial of access to medical care in detention, the use of prolonged solidarity, confinement, ill treatment by the prison guard, and so on. So this is very, very massive, as you can see, human rights abuses happening inside the prison as well. And let's see under what uh, economic circumstances the Iranian regime really implements such a brutal and uh, unthinkable human rights abuses. So I think this is the paragraph 34 of the report. Official data show that year on year, inflation in the period of August to September 2021 was 45%. With, with food prices increased by 60% compared to the same period the previous year. 60%, 6-0. According to the Statistical Center of Iran, about 20% of the population with the highest income hold 47% of the wealth, where, uh, while the 20% with the lowest income hold 0.5% of the wealth. High food and life cost combined with low wages continue to push people below the poverty line and increase in equality gap. Over 30% of the population was estimated to live below the poverty line as of August 2021. We're talking about at least 35 million Iranians. Environmental and land-related issues pose a threat to the right to the adequate standard of living, particularly in minority-populated provinces, in addition to the war crisis in Khuzestan and Isfahan, there is a severe water shortage in Sistan and Baluchistan provinces, leading inhabitants to pitch water from nearby river with the high risk of the ruin. About 28 million of the country's 83 million people live in areas with the water shortage, mainly in the central and southern region of the country. Uh, so we touch on the, all this suppression misabuse it, and let's see what is really the reaction of people to this, all this. That's uh, the first part, is a part of the Iranian human rights uh, report that we collected during the year and been announced earlier this year. Uh, based on the Iranian human rights organization report in 2021, about 12,360 protests have been recorded in Iran. Every single day, at least about 33 to 34 protests have been taken, taken up by the Iranians. In 31 provinces, it means all Iran, and among most sectors of Iranian society, including workers, teachers, nurses, retired women, and you name it. This is part of the uh, Professor Javi Rahman report. In a ser series of protests that erupted in mid July 2021, in over 20 cities in Khuzestan province, subsequently extending to other areas, including Isfahan, Luristan, Azerbaijan, Sharki means uh, East Azerbaijan, Tehran, and Karaj, and they have been referred to as a uprising of the Thirsty people for war, leading to the killing of at least eight individuals, including two children, and in the injuring of a large number of others. Internet shutdowns were reported in several places. Many of those injured went into the hiding and didn't go to the hospital for the fear of being arrested. 
report confirmed that over 300, uh, uh, 360 individuals were arrested in Susan Gates city alone. It's just a small city in South of Iran. At least nine children aged between 12 and 18 years were also reported to be arrested. In November 2021, several peaceful protests took place in Isfahan, culminating with the thousands of the farmers and other rallies on 19 November to decry the drying up of the Zaya and the Root River, the redirection of its water to neighboring provinces, and the impact on the road. On 26 November, a large number of the security forces violently attacked the protest site and set the farmer tent on fire to prevent, prevent further protests. They used, they used baton, tea guns, and threat guns in the violent crackdown on the protest, leading to head and eye injury and arresting of at least 200 individuals. In paragraph 30, one stated, over 350 protests took place between June and October 2021 in several sectors of Iranian economy. The most widespread strike was held by workers in the oil, gas, and petrochemical industry between mid-June mid and uh, end of September 2021. The strike was begun by temporary contract workers and spread to over 100 oil, gas, and petrochemical sites across the country. It is estimated that 75% of, of the workers in the oil industry are temporary contract workers. The teacher held four waves of the nationwide protests since August last year, up to January this year. This strike considered as the largest Iranian teacher protest in the past 43 years. A number of teachers have been arrested and currently are, uh, are in prison. In fact, uh, since December 2017, there were several large nationwide protests by Iranian people in rejection of the regime in Tyre. During this uprising, a network of brave Iranians were able to form a nationwide resistance that called resistance unit, and now is the only hope for a democratic change in Iran. Uh, to summarize it, I should say that the High Excellency Professor Javid Rahman uh, report can be highlighted in three, three important points. The first one, he clearly indicated that the continuation of massive systematic of violation of human rights violation in Iran which is the, the main route for the people decided to seek asylum in other, in, in other parts of the world. And, and secondly, the failure of international community to obligate a state like Iran or even Australia to uphold human rights principles, the serious shortcoming in the legal framework and justice system together with systematic violation of the due process and fair trial rather than most, if not all, execution in the Islamic Republic of Iran arbitrary deprivation of life. And the third is the impunity. The impunity that members of these states are enjoying and lack of, of accountability. The atmosphere of impunity surrounding arbitrary deprivation of life by a state agent said an affirmation that there will be no consequence for such an illegal act. Uh, within the above mentioned system of governing, it is clear that obtaining accountability for human rights violation becomes unfortunately arbit arbitrary at best and impossible at worst. The official reporter eventually at the last paragraph, paragraph 73, urged the international community to call for accountability with respect to long-standing emblematic events that have been made with per persistent impunity, including the enforced disappearance and summary and arbitrary execution of 1988 and the November 2019 protests. Therefore, by simply looking at this report, you can see 
when a lot of people from Middle East coming where where situation they really escape for. And I know there were a lot of Iranians, unfortunately not Iranian, a lot of refugees in Australia been subjected to uh, the same mistreatment. Uh, long, uh, prolonged uh, solidarity confinement like Ned Kelly, uh, killing uh, under the excuse of the medical access like my grand colleagues Ali Rahimi died in detention center in Bilawood. And uh, I can name it, unfortunately two of them, they couldn't come to here. Refugees live here in 13 years, brother and sister, no access to medical, Medicare, no access to higher education, no, not even under the supervision of the Red Cross and so on. So unfortunately we need uh, strong people and uh, good policy to push our politicians to do the right thing and remove such a inhuman and brutal uh, restriction against the uh, displaced people. Uh, once again, I thank you so much for listening to my <laughs> long statement and be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.
and Iranians are suffering for so many years and so many decades. Thank you so much. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one, but you, you have to understand why, why one protests in the first place. You don't just protest randomly at other places in the world where human rights violations are happening. You're protesting against your, your, your country's own policy with respect to that, or the respect to refugees, or whatever it is. You're, you're protesting against what your government is doing. Now, Iran is sort of like an official enemy. There are already sanctions against Iran. Um, I, I'm in solidarity with Iranians, and I went to the demonstration this on, uh, yesterday. And, and I always join Iranian demonstrations for, for human rights in, in Iran. But I suppose it's because, you know, the West is so much responsible for what's happening to Palestinians. That's why we protest. That's why it's a bigger protest among Westerners, I suppose. Not that any of these protests are very big, I have to say, but, yeah, they're a bit bigger for Palestinians. There's more solidarity for them because we are helping our, gov our governments, the governments in this country and the United States and Britain are helping the repression of, of, of Palestinians. They're not actually helping the repression, oppression significantly of, of Iranians. That's how I see it. I may be wrong, but that's how I see the situation. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you, Nikki, mm -hmm. for your comment. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah. uh, I can just simply add it to what I said that uh, probably because uh, uh, still there is. I think it's, yes, it's worth now. Thank you. I think the policy that the Western government is really uh, used to confront Iran, we call it in today. If a policy of appeasement because Iran, George W. Bush says something in 2001 or I think yeah, before the invasion of Iraq, he says we are, we've been in debt, in, in debt to oil and the oil is in there, in their hands. So we need to go and get it. And that is the way they, they really they balance their policy. The policy of appeasement, the policy of that uh, uh, long term of negotiation with dictators, became uh, a behavior, unfortunately, of Europeans and at some states, some other, other countries, and that the consequences are so tough, even not for, on refugees, but on themselves as well. Look what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Syria, what happened in Yemen. So once they suffer, we suffer in Australia as well. There is no, no way to escape of that. But how and, uh, how and when they will come to that conclusion to to really enough is enough? That's a big question we should ask them, and I hope uh, we need to be more more united, working more together, understanding the, the differences between the community in Australia, and at the same time, uh, we have to push really Australian government to do the right things. We can't, we can't go like that every day witnessing uh, an Iranian, an Iraqi, a, Bang a Bangladesh, this uh, Sri Lankan man, woman being killed, being deported. That should be uh, given an end to it. And as uh, my friend indicated, it should be, became a very bad example for international community while we can be the flag holder for the refugees and asylum seekers and the people, freedom and right. Okay, any other person want to ask a question down the back? Just give me that yeah. mic off. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if it is interrupted. Yes, yes, that's fine. Yes, yes. Hello, um, I'm Joffrey. Hi, John. And uh, I do support your focus. I do support many other focus with regard to human rights. But that is a big problem. We seem to be fighting for human rights on many fronts, from refugees to indigenous people's rights to uh, other rights, gay rights, rights to the environment. And we need a uniting front to protect all these rights, Other, otherwise we will be divided and conquered, as we have been divided and conquered in the meantime. How do you feel that, why don't we all unite under declaring a state 
statements of to finally have in our constitution a bill or charter of rights that covers all our concerns so that we are no longer divided among our different fronts. Well, this is a very good question. Thank you, Geoffrey. And of course, we should have a Bill of Rights. Uh, not a Bill of Rights. That's too difficult. That's legally very hard to do. A Human Rights Act would be... Uh, is this working? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, would be... Uh, human Rights Act would be doable. Which is what we really, really need. I forgot to mention this. When we don't have... When we're not talk, talking in terms of human rights, particularly with refugees, I was going to say this, that what happens is you get the narrative of, oh... Um, refugees have done so much good in Australia, which is which is true. But refugees are a mixed bag. You know, they're like you and me. They just had to get out of their country because of persecution. But you get that good refugee or the poor, vulnerable refugee. And I hate these stereotypes, really. You know, I hate Frank Lowy with the Westfield or the the Iraqi, you know, surgeon who retrained and is now a fantastic. These are exceptional type situations. Refugees have their humanity, have their, uh, as human beings, and they have human rights. That's the end of it. No good refugee, bad refugee. But if you have a good refugee and a poor refugee, you can also have the refugee who's char charged or, or, or Dutton says they're molesting children. That's easy. He does it all the time. In fact, I'd be a bit worried about the Dutton. The, the, the number of times he, charges, uh, he, he accuses other people of molesting children, I, I'd be worried about that man. But... That's, if, you, if you don't have the human rights, you have these stereotypes, and which, are, which are easy to shoot down, very easy. We need a human rights culture in this country, and we need to fight for that human rights act that you're talking about, very much so. So, yes, I, I drink to that, yeah. Okay, who's next? Okay. disheartening up going out and talking to these refugees there and, and coming home and, and people not really being too sympathetic and that seems to me to be the biggest problem so I want to put to both speakers how are we going to get across this issue that uh, I believe you in the speech the other day that budget reply had no mention of it Biden's going to go through some tough, tough times leading up to the midterms because he's opening up the border in the south that Trump has closed out, not totally obviously, but opening it up a bit, and yet he might lose the, the midterms. Similarly, if, if the Labour Party declared its support on the lines that you're talking about, we might be having another tamper, you know, threat. So how do we get out there and convince people that these are that our rights and responsibilities as a party to the United Nations first principles has to be carried out. Thank you. I think thank you for the question. I think uh, the one of the, the, the matters that the department are really very smart to work on it. They run a misinformation and disinformation campaign when it comes to the refugees and asylum seekers. So that's the one of the matters. We should stop the uh, the, stop the campaign of fear, fear that run by this uh, uh, any uh, department or government official minister. So uh, that I think first step. The second the second one. We really we are not persist in our request. Like uh, uh, I work with a lot of different Australian human rights organization. They they have a very clear uh, lines that to don't cross so many things. Like when it comes to the violation of rights of people back at home, they don't want to talk any single word about it. They say our concept uh, concentrate is on Australian soul and Australian policy, which is somebody like me will be super confused because I really work hard to go back where I came from. <laughs> I really do that. 
I just want to go back where I came from, but uh, there is no opportunity. This is another matter. So we need a persistent campaign to push people. I and mean, we should be out the street to the public, talk to them, and uh, push them in the right direction because it's good for our kids. Look while they see me, my kids, my children, as a foreigner came here, grew up here, uh, his, they really would suffer. They will suffer, they see now that they invade them. While we just, <laughs> the same people like them coming for the same class to, to live in peace and have a, have a normal life. So, and, and the third thing, politicians. So once they get to that seat in wherever they, uh, they, they taking it, they shouldn't forget their promises. And as we can see, Peter mentioned it at the start, uh, up to the election, they signed it, uh, uh, the, whatever they call it, memorandum of understanding, a uh, sweeping of refugees with the New Zealand, uh, give the people an option, a wrong window again, that we're really doing the right thing. So when the, pe the a guy, a person can come, go to New Zealand, why he couldn't come to Australia? If it's danger for the new the, for the community, why is wrong? Why we should impose such a bad thing to the New Zealand government? Let them come here, and that's where the, the, a lot of issues come. We need really a strong, as my colleagues indicated, a frontier. We should form a frontier of the community, those suffering uh, because of the dictatorship at home, uh, to fight and struggle with this uh, with this issue. Yeah. I think that doesn't work. Okay. Well, when I met Mohammed uh, some time ago, look, I knew we were on the same wavelength when he, he said the people at the head of these organisations, these NGOs, have to be fighters. They can't just be stuffed shirts. And to be honest, I don't see them, many of them, as fighters at all. I, I don't. I, and I see the people on the streets that, uh, with, with, with the major sort of refugee groups, and they do good rallies. But it's hardship story, hardship story, overcoming hardship, hardship story, overcoming hardship. And then we talk about the revolution or something. But we really should be talking about that Human Rights Act. We should be making progress on this. You know, the things that are achievable, really. Um, revolution would be lovely one other day. But we should be making these progressive things. And taking, uh, democratizing the ABC, I see, is a big part of it. They are just ignoring, ignoring things wholesale. It's just pathetic. And, you know, Philip Adams, he does some good stuff, but, like, he, he shoves in little things about refugees, like, between the sentences, just between the... What the heck? This is a major human rights violation. And we're acting like we're in some, like, Eastern Bloc country in the 1970s. You know, really. This is not on. And that's what I get so angry about. Um, you know, we've read about Solzhenitsyn. You know, I grew up with my father travelling back and forth from the Soviet Union, well, from Eastern Bloc countries. And I'm used to this kind of repression. This is a free society. And we can't even find out when someone dies in custody or, or dies in, in the, by, killed by the police or, or it's, it's gone within five minutes in the news cycle. It's disgusting. And the ABC, I'd like to hold them, something has to be done about that. The, the democratization of the ABC, not the standover funding withdrawals that we see all the time. And, and, and the threats to the ABC. I don't like the ABC as it is now. I don't think they've got much, any courage. Or it's not, I don't think there's a collegial atmosphere. You can't even get a letter for them. It looks like a fortress back over there where you used to be able to walk through. So, so many aspects have made it part of the oppressive nature. And if I can just like really thank one person during the East Timor campaign who really understood what public broadcasting was about, and that was Sandy McCutcheon. And probably most of you here will be old enough to remember him. He knew what public broadcasting was. Australia talks back. It was brilliant. And, and we get so... You write to them, there's nothing. It's like a fortress. It's, a, it's like a psychological fortress and a physical one over on Jones Street. Is that where it is? Harris Street. So, so I think we should be pushing for democratisation of the, of the media and not this direct control of funding that the government has and control of people on the board and either Patro's on the top. Uh, it, it, it's just... It's no wonder we... We don't see, we don't get good reporting. We don't, we don't get human rights even mentioned. Anyway, shut up, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, just to go right back to Nikki's first question, it's something that troubles me a lot. How, how did, how has the Western world, and especially the left wing of the Western world, 
uh, really engage with the Iranian story. So um, I know from the National Council of Resistance of Iran that it, it includes conservatives and social democrat forces from lots and lots of countries. So it's not as if it's uh, only the, the conservatives have done anything, uh, uh, these others have done it. But I think that the far left, though, has uh, had a big problem with Iran. The, the number one issue is because the United States is so antagonistic yeah. to the regime in Tehran, at least on the headline level, therefore there's an instinctive reaction, uh, sort of unthought through, really, to defend them, whoever they are, no matter if they're mass murderers. And um, so uh, instead of thinking about, well, what's happening to the Iranian people? And one other angle has been that in the Greens, which has been an important uh, political force in Europe, especially, and it's also significant in Australia. Um, the Greens have looked at it and seen a sort of anti-Muslim uh, line of attack on the government of Iran instead of, instead of seeing an anti-fascist one. And um, so they have been really stopping um, more effective action in Europe for a long time. And that has had its echo here in Australia. So in fact, in the politics in Australia, we have some Greens who have been good on this, like Lee Rhiannon and David Shoebridge, but we have, all the other Greens have been pretty, pretty much closed door on this. So uh, there's a lot of um, introspection we need on the left to rebuild ourselves, which other speakers have referred to. And I do think that we must go back to the reference point of the working people, the farmers, the poor people, what's happening to them. They are the soul of any country. They're the soul of Iran and we have to stand with them in the first instance. Same with Australia, same with our own society. So um, I, I just leave with those thoughts. Mm. But don't give up. Don't very give good. up to stop. Well, 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 well. Okay, thanks very much. I'll come and talk to you in a second. But thanks.